G'day everybody, and for those who have come in late, you're listening to X-Band, the Phantom Podcast. He washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks! The Phantom! Enemies beware! The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. He finds you. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team, and this is Expand the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, and you can also contact us via our email, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. You can subscribe to our podcast at uh, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and the various other Android apps. My name is Jermaine, and today I am joined by the full crew in Dan and Stephen. How are you going, guys? Very good, Jim. Very good. Happy to be here. It's a Sunday night, um, and happy to be talk- talking fandoming. Well, what's the other option, mate? Watching uh, MasterChef? Yeah, well, Lego Masters is finished now, um, so, so <laughs> and I'm not into MasterChef. So, yeah, but I did enjoy Lego Masters while I was going around. <laughs> That's good. Stephen, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, doing well. I'm glad to um to be back on board. It's been a couple of podcasts without me, I think, uh, at the moment. So I'm glad I've been able to to get away from it. Uh, we we watched Lego Masters on the catch up. My kids are into it, which is really good. <laughs> which means um the wallet cops are, are hiding though, because Lego's not not uh not cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's probably well, a good it. thing. It's probably a good yeah. thing, Stephen, with your football team sucking at the moment as well, that you're watching something <laughs> else. Uh, it's good to do the, the rebuilding stage and the building yeah. up stage. Yeah, yeah, so, building, yeah. rebuilding, yeah. 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 yeah, I see what you did yeah. there. Yeah, very good, <laughs> very good. So um, so thank you for joining us, guys. Thank you for joining in to us listeners. Uh, today we've got a special guest. Uh, his name is uh, Glenn. He's not the Glenn Four that most people will know. He's Glenn Lumsden. And um, I'm looking forward to speaking to Glenn. Uh, I've I've been speaking to him on and off for you know for a good couple of years. Um, we've been talking about this this uh, guest for the podcast for a while as well. And um, Stephen, I think we may have someone who actually lives in a colder part of Australia than you. <laughs> well, you live in Gordon down the road. <laughs> so, uh, Glenn, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Um, so where, whereabouts, where, where do we find you today? I'm in a little town called Deloraine in Tasmania. And oh, what, probably got me beat then. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought it might be uh, colder than you, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you for joining us on the podcast, Glenn. Um, now, for those who have come in late, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your age or your range of your age, your career? And then, and then we can just kind of go from there because um, uh, we've got a few questions and then we can kind of shoot from there. Yep. Um, I'm 57 and um, I've been doing comics since the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, doing uh, stuff uh, you know, uh, in Australia and um, then uh, becoming professional and finally doing stuff in America which is where I got the first opportunity to have a crack at, at the Phantom in the 90s with Marvel Comics. <clears throat> um, and then I kind of, my career sort of segued out of comics into just general commercial art for a while. And now I'm back into comics. And it just happened to coincide with the time that Glenn Ford is an old mate and, and uh, his partners uh, bought into Fru. And so it was just a great opportunity. He contacted me and said, you know, would I like to get involved doing art again for the Phantom? And, uh, yeah, I went, absolutely. Awesome. So I must admit, I thought it was the late 80s. Uh, that was when you were on the Australian comic scene. Um, so I was out by a decade, so I apologise for well, that. The thing is, it's like the Australian comic scene is a really nebulous kind of beast because... There's, you know, it, it, you could just as easily call it a, a, cottage, a, a, a cottage industry or a hobby. Yeah. And then at some stage, it sort of finally creeps into being semi-professional. So, for instance, when I started doing comics, I was um, doing layouts 
for a friend of mine, Tad, who had this character called the Dark Nebula. And so I'd do, I'd go over to his place. I was still at school. I, you know, I'd go over to his place and we'd just draw fun comics together. And then he started to print the comics. And then I started to draw them for him. Um, and then we met some other friends like Gary Challoner and Dave DeVries. And we all joined forces and we were producing comics. And again, it started out as um, low print runs and we didn't know if they were going to sell it all. And then they started to sell and we actually got to a point where we were selling as many issues in Australia as you know, comics like Batman and stuff like that, which to put it in context, Australia doesn't have a huge audience. You know, I reckon 5,000 back then was about as many as you could sell. And so once you reached that point, it didn't really matter whether you were Batman or, you know, Cyclone comics or whatever, you'd kind of, that's it. That was saturation. So you then have to say to yourself, well, where do we go from here? So in our case, well, Dave and I, Dave DeVries and I teamed up and we started to approach magazines with bigger reach, like um, who might use comics, like uh, Mad Magazine and Penthouse Magazine and just anyone who might conceivably have a comic in them. Yeah. What age were you then, then that you were doing that? What's that? What age were you then when you were doing that? Um, so I was born in 64, so I would have been in my 20s, mid, early to mid-20s. Yep. And then I started, we, we, start, we uh, approached the Americans in uh, about 1990, I reckon, and started to do some gigs with a, a, a small, smallish American company called Malibu, who ended up being a big company. But when we were um, dealing with them, they were still sort of a bit of a boutique, black and white, mainly comic uh, group. And then once you're doing stuff for America, you just kind of, you do the best job you can for whoever you're with. And then you've got something to shop to other companies. And you kind of, you know, eventually approach Dark Horse or DC or Marvel and you've got something to show them, which, you know, is American that they can relate to. And, you know, it might take a couple of goes, but eventually they might go, yeah, we'll give you a go. But then what they'll do is that they will pick one of their, they, they won't give you the premier title. They will say, you know, do an issue of Aquaman or something. Um, and then they see how you go. And, and once you, if you do an okay job of that, then again, you can work your way up the internal ladder of that company where so for instance in dc the big prize would be doing batman or superman back then i don't, I don't know if it still is and in marvel the big prize would be spider-man and x-men or whatever so just, just so how, happened to, oh sorry oh i was just going to say so how high on that ladder did you get well we we got a batman gig which i never finished that was i just got um uh, i was just got that stage where i just burnt out and that's that really got me to look at doing um commercial art and general advertising art and stuff because um the i i think i i uh i was probably wasn't ready for the amount of work and the uh the pressure that came with doing those american monthly books and stuff like that and i worked with i had to work with a lot of other good good mates who were helping me do backgrounds and things like that so we had a little studio going of about five people wow. and it just got too much and i just remember like when I, when I was doing the batman story our editor at that time was archie goodwin i don't know if you've ever heard of archie goodwin but he's a really well-known um person in the comic industry and he he had got cancer and died and i remember he said to me i just said oh man i'm not handling this at all well and he said glenn mate it's only comics just you know you can always choose not to do them <coughs> all words to that effect and um at the time i didn't realize that he was on his last legs so when he died first of all i was really appreciative that he 
had the patience and the compassion, I guess, to seriously discuss with me and my <laughs> angst about, oh, I'm, I'm freaking out about doing comics. Meanwhile, he's dying. <laughs> he doesn't even mention that to me. <laughs> yeah. He just you know, gave me some really good solid advice. When he died, I sort of thought, well, now's the opportune time to just pull the plug because Archie's dead and no one even knows probably this project even exists. Because it's funny with um, those big companies, you get all these editors and they'll each be in charge of certain books. And it's almost like they're the king of their own little world. Yeah. And none of the other editors necessarily know what an editor has commissioned. So no one knew that Archie had hired some Australians to do a, a Batman story. Mm. So it was really easy just to kind of stop doing it, which is what I did. So how far in the story did you get? I finished the first issue and I just started the second one. <coughs> were you living over the States at the time or were you doing that? What was that? Sorry? Were you living over in the States at the time or were you over here? With... No, no, I never lived in the States. We were living yeah. in um, South Australia. And what you do is just go over to America a couple of times a year. What I found was I went over a couple of times. Dave DeVries, the writer, he'd go over more often. He might go three times a year, often without me, because I just found the workload of drawing. We just yeah. got to the stage where I just couldn't afford the time. It was just yeah. like all consuming seven days a week, 16 hours a day. It was just, you know, um, it's heavy duty. Uh, and um, that's why now working with Fru, um, it's great having a, a close mate in Glenn Ford who um, I just said to him, look, I'd love to do some phantom stories, but can I just have no deadlines? <laughs> and he, went, yep. he said, when you've done it, give it to me and I'll print it. I went, beautiful. Awesome. So you made mention of Glenn Ford. Now, um, uh, what you, you before the podcast, you were telling us a little bit about how you met Glenn and your relationship with him. Um, yep. Could you, could you uh, go over that again for us? Yep. I met Glenn, I must have been about 12 or 13. And it was funny, like back in the 70s, the um, comic scene was really uh, tiny and the only way you even knew the existence of other comic book collectors was through, like in the Sunday paper, there's a little swap section uh, in amongst the comics and you'd you know, find these little ads for like, want to swap, want to swap Marvel and DC comics? Yeah. Do and um, that was uh, where I saw Glenn Ford must have run the ad or something. And... Um, and so we just got together outside this, I think it was the one shop that sold comics in Sydney called the Crystal Palace Book Arcade. And, and we just all meet outside this shop with our bags of comics and we just sort of block up the doorway for all the customers while we're sort of like going through each other's comics going, oh, do you want to swap this for this? And Glenn Ford must have been about 20 and looked like um, sort of like this really groovy rock star or something with his... <laughs> Permed afro and his big moustache, sort of chunky sort of jewellery and body shirt. And I was going like, wow, he's like real grown-up kind of cool guy. And, um, yeah, and, and <laughs> that was the, how we met, swapping comics. And then over the years, when I was doing Phantom for Marvel in the 90s, we obviously met again. And, uh, you know, he organised a, a, a signing tour for us. Um, and then the third time we've worked together is now, you know, in this since he's got involved with fruit. Um, I've, I'm sure I've got a picture of this, of the big moustache and all that. So on yeah, the video, yeah. I'm going to put that up. Yeah, yeah. Like have you, I don't know if you've um, ever watched the Brady Bunch, but there's this <laughs> episode of the Brady Bunch where Greg thinks he's going to be this big rock pop star, and he adopts the name of Johnny Bravo, and he's that's. If you whack a moustache on Johnny Bravo, that was Glenn Ford. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's awesome. So, um, so you, you talked about, uh, so you grew up in, uh, so you, you said before that you worked in the Barossa Valley you're now yep. in Tasmania. Um, but I believe you grew up and 
in, in, in Sydney, is that correct? Yep. yep. That's so right. did you did you also grow up did you grow up with the Phantom? Was the Phantom a, a comic that you read as a child or Yeah, the, the, uh, it's funny, like I was a huge Marvel fan. Um, and uh, I believe the term is Marvel Zombie. And um, but the Phantom was something that I always read in the newspapers. And I'd go through these periods as well where I would just for some reason pick up the Phantom comic for six months. And I'd have a little run of buying the Phantom, along with all my Marvel comics and stuff. And then I'd stop buying it for some reason. But I'd always follow it in the, in the newspapers. And of course, every Easter show, what did you get in the show bag? Phantom comic. Um, yeah. In fact, they used to, used to, I reckon that was the catalyst for why I'd go to the news agency and start buying, you know, Phantom for six months. Um, but the Phantom, the Phantom is, is a different kettle of fish to your Marvel DC, as you know. Um, and so he was always a bit kind of unusual, uh, you know, for someone who's used to, you know, following the adventures of the Fantastic Four and the X-Men and that sort of stuff. The Phantoms are really standalone kind of, almost like he lived in a different, completely different universe, a different sort of genre. It wasn't how I understood, understood comics. It was almost like... Um, well, now I can see he was a bit more like a pulp hero, you know, and I know obviously his origins go back to that time, but whereas in the Marvel universe, you would have lots and lots of heroes, you know, X-Men would be, meet the Avengers and then they'd all be crisscrossing and stuff. The Phantom was more like the only masked dude in a world of normal people. Yeah. So he was more kind of special. Yeah. I always thought there was nothing dumber than in Marvel when all the heroes got together for a conference or something and they were just standing there in these stupid uniforms just talking like, oh, I'm Hawkman, I've got wings. And, oh, oh. and um, whereas the, the Phantom was a bit more like spooky because the story could be about regular people and then suddenly there'd be this mysterious guy sort of like appearing out of nowhere who is he's got a skull and he's got this devil and um and it, it was just a very different vibe which i now realize is a lot more like if you've ever read any pop stories like the shadow or the avenger or the spider or that sort of stuff it's the same lines it's like the underworld and the cops and stuff and then there's this one mysterious guy who comes in and you know beats all the I think, Glenn, that that something that certainly that I um, love about the Phantom, with regard to what you're saying, and I think a lot of fans would agree, is that it's set in the real world, if you like, like the the DC and the Marvels. That's fantastic and fantastical, and it could never exist, and we all know that because those people don't exist. But the Phantom could exist, and as you say, he's the only masked dude in a world form of normal people. He walks the streets like an ordinary man, and so therefore he just blends in. And it could be from it, it could actually exist, and I think that's something that we all kind of we all kind of love about the Phantom. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did find though, um, because I mean, the Phantom's been going for so long, and you can't, as much as you'd love to, stick to the same sort of arena of stories. It, it, there comes a time when you've got to change the uh, the type of story that's being told. And there was this period. I think it might have been in the seventies. Might have even been in the late sixties where these sort of fantasy elements started to creep in. And um, I remember a particular story about a, a blue giant who just aliens had inside him. And I, I remember, actually, as a kid, I just didn't mind the story. But now that one really rankles with me. I sort of read and I go, because eh, I guess the phantom I really love is the one who's on like some uh, ocean liner in the middle of the sea and some, you know, someone's been killed or some jewels been stolen. And there's this mysterious guy in the cabin who's, you know, did he do it or whatever? And it turns out to be the phantom. He's crawling in and out of portholes. He's thumping people. They're falling into those funnels down into the, into the guts yeah. of the ship. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, I really love that sort of stuff. And um, the fantasy stuff with the little people and the, yeah, I, I guess horses for courses, and I totally understand some people might dearly love those stories, but for me, I don't like the golden beach of Kilauea, and I don't like his and hers. And What yeah, about, what about Steggy? What's that? 
What about Steggy the Stegosaurus? Yeah, you see, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but things up. Well, the, and some people might love that stuff, but that's yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of fan fans, Sean and Nick. They're fans of Steggy and, and yep. stuff like that. So to each um, their own. To each their own. And um, I mean, in some ways, I I don't mind a story that if it's like you know the Phantom is a, goes through this waterfall and is in this land ruled by some you know seductive princess or whatever, and but then he wakes up at the end going. You know, realizing he's just been hit on the head with a coconut. Did that happen? And he finds like a little bracelet or whatever. Mm, maybe yeah. it did. We will never know. But yeah, uh, can't really I, I, the, I think the story that you described there that was amongst your favorite s- story types, Glenn, almost exactly describes the plot of Death Dive. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, Death Dives, I had to do the, um, had to be set on a boat because I love that idea of, uh, You've got to get on the boat. You've got to swim out there. You've got to go into water, sneak on the boat, sneak around. But it's you're kind of trapped. And it's the same with um, stories that are set on, like, the Orient Express. You know, you're in a train. Maybe a sort of landslide or a snow slide has locked you in. It's just the people in the train. You've got to go in and out of compartments. And yeah. <laughs> haunted houses, I love those too. Secret passageways, <laughs> um, you know, so chimneys that swing, swing around and, you know, oh, got to do one of those as well. Um, often when I come up with an idea for a story, I start off with a particular hook that appeals to me and tr- then try to build the story around that, that vibe or that hook. So, for instance, um, you know, the idea of a house full of secret passages, I have always loved that since I was a kid and I still love it. And so I just think, right, got to do a secret passage in a house story. And then you worry about building the plot. But deep down inside, I know it's the secret passage that's, you know, that's motivating me to do the story. Well, well, Glenn, I can I pitch you an idea? They're, I just... they're rebuilding the Notre Dame at the moment and the fandom notoriously has a room in. Oh, I think yeah. we need to do a secret passages in Notre Dame plot for... <laughs> <laughs> that would be per- that would work brilliantly. Um, talking about secret, um, well, I'll, secret I'll rooms and stuff like that. Credits. There you go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. You've you've got uh, one of your giant size covers uh, yeah. featured not one but two secret passages, and on the back cover as well, there's someone coming through the uh, the, the wall behind the shadow on the back, um, and. Is there any other coming oh, through? I, yeah, I don't have the I don't have the back cover on me. I've just got the front yeah. cover, unfortunately, for that one. But um, <laughs> yeah, as you were talking about your secret covers, uh, the giant size for those who are on audio you won't be able to see this, but giant size number nine um, featured a couple of secret cu- uh, secret passages. Yep. Awesome. So. Um, I know we kind of talked a little bit about uh, Death Dive and Giant Size, but I was wondering uh, if we could do this uh, chronologically and go back to the Marvel Phantom. Sure. Um, now, uh, Glenn, could you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Um, obviously, there was uh, David, uh, who was the writer. Yep. Um, seems like you two got up to a lot of mischief together, from what yes. I can gather. Yep. Uh, so if you could just tell us a little bit about the Marvel Phantom, how that happened um, and, and, and stuff like that, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay, so my memory is usually notoriously bad. So I think, I think this is what happened, is <laughs> we were in New York and we were going to uh, DC and Marvel and whoever else was in New York and showing them the stuff we were doing. And we were in at Marvel talking to, I think it was Fabian Nicieza, and um, we were chatting about, you know, what sort of things could we do for Marvel? And he said he'd just been contacted by King Features, who wanted Marvel to do Flash Gordon, Mandrake, and Phantom. I think that was the three. Um, but they wanted them to do them like, like Marvel versions of the character because I, I guess they just wanted to expand their audience because, as, as I was previously saying, you know, the Phantom is a standalone sort of pulp character and he's, he's very different um, to standard Marvel stuff. So King Features were 
trying to find a way of, I guess, getting the Phantom more acceptable to your typical Marvel reader. And um, Fabian Nicieza, when he was talking to us, he said, hey, the Phantom's really popular in Australia. And we went, yeah. He said, do you guys want to do this? And we just went, yeah. And that was it. <laughs> That's awesome. It. Yeah. it happened in about five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> um, and then uh, I think we had... I think we had a couple of other jobs lined up which we had to do first. So there was a bit of lead-up time, but that was cool because Dave had to write it and research it and had to have a chat with um, uh, Lee Fork just to run ideas past him and make sure that we weren't going to do anything that was going to be too upsetting or anything or too, you know, because, like, Lee was obviously happy to have the Phantom become a bit more Marvel-esque, if you like, yeah. Um, to a degree, but you know, there's always there's a there's a limit, and yeah. so that was just good to also. It's just it was nice for an opportunity to to talk to Lee. I didn't personally talk to Lee myself. Um, Dave did, um, but yeah, once we kind of figured we're all on the same page, uh, then it was just a matter of writing it and drawing it. And I think drawing it took about a, a year and a half. It, all um, three issues. Yeah, three issues and was the classic thing of instead of finishing the three issues and then publishing, boom, 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 I think I'd finished two issues and said, start printing, I'll be able to finish the third one easy. <laughs> and, of course, couldn't. And um, I think there was a big gap between the second and the third one. I can't remember now. But And also, as the project went on, um, the workload was becoming a bit overwhelming. And so in the first issue, that's pretty much all my art with a bit of help from my assistants. And then as the issues went on, I, I, I couldn't do as much of the art as I wanted. So I was doing like faces and stuff and getting other people to help with bodies. And um, so I just found it less kind of... Uh, fulfilling I guess but from a personal point of view because I mean ideally I would love to just draw all of the stuff that I draw myself um, and it starts off with well I'll get someone to help just with you know doing the, the backgrounds or whatever but then bit by bit it becomes you know can you do the background figures and the, you know this figure and that figure and um, uh, yeah I just find that's not my optimum way of working. Whereas now, doing the stuff for free, um, I'm doing all of it, and I'm doing it. I'm doing it until I'm happy with it, and I'm not. I'm not uh, letting go of the thing until <laughs> I've done it the way I want it to look. Yeah, which is really painstaking. Takes ages, and I mean, there's not a lot of money in it to start with, but by the time I have spent you know, a month drawing one one panel, <laughs> I have really destroyed the <laughs> profitability of, <laughs> of it. So what I used to do is I used to have this um, food trailer business called Haddo's Hot Dogs. and Really? Yeah, it was great because, I mean, I, I love doing it, um, but you'd make your money, your living money doing Haddo's Hot Dogs, which would be on the weekend, like going to the footy and doing it, and then I'd have enough money in the week to just, luxuriate over every panel I was drawing <laughs> and not have to worry about money. But mm -hmm. um, with the COVID lockdown and everything, that killed that. Um, and so now I'm basically just uh, doing it tough financially. <laughs> but the thing is what I'll have to do is I'll just have to take on some more commercial art just to balance it. You know, I, I would love to not have to do that. But... Um, I've got to be realistic, and if I if I want to honour my my dream of doing the best comic art I can, um, then I'm going to have to compromise in terms of doing the odd wine label or you know whatever, yeah. whatever it takes. Yeah, it's no. Now, now oh, I just wanted to talk mm -hmm. about 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 the Phantom. Now this is uh, the twenty second Phantom. If, if you're on yeah. YouTube, you'll see. Uh, some panels coming up now the 20 
the twenty second Phantom features an updated uh, costume with um uh, with some infrared, and he's got his little um uh, little code breaking uh, gauntlet there and stuff. Was that was that David who came up with those ideas of modernizing or well, marvelizing the Phantom? I think we we both did. I think we both kind of just sat down and chatted about yeah, what sort of things he should have to make him more like and and, and keeping in mind. The era. This is the era yeah. where all the Marvel characters were like the Punisher, and everyone carried, you know, twin giant machine guns strapped to every limb, and um, and, yeah, and sort of Batman was that uh, Dark Knight kind of psychopath type yeah. dude. So that was the um, that was the the zeitgeist of the era, if you like. Mm. So it's like um, I guess we were trying to tap into that. Um, sure. And so it was all like I don't know, body armor and little computery things and whatever. Um, which I mean, I don't know. I'm sure Phantom purists just sort of hate it. And to be honest, I I am enjoying having another crack at doing the Phantom, but doing him um, the traditional way these days. I'm not saying I you know, regret in any way doing the 90s one, but um, and also that was the gig. The gig was make him like a Marvel character. So yeah. we fulfilled that that part of the promise. Um, but um, I guess in the fullness of time, I've just come back to trying to tap into what I loved about the Phantom when I was a kid. Yeah. And um, the things I loved about the Phantom um, don't require any gadgets or whatever you know the phantom he's just got his he's got his guns and he's got his uh moral yes. compass and he's he's admirable you know he's yeah. um but at the same time he's rough on roughnecks so it's like he's fair but he's tough and yeah. and he's a man of few yeah. words but he's got a sense of humor he's not one of these humorless punisher type characters who's just relentlessly grim. The Phantom, he laughs a lot. Um, and he also likes to play up on his his ghostly image. He'll use that to his advantage to freak out the bad guys, but he doesn't believe it himself. Or does he? See, this is, I love that sort of stuff. It's like um, it's that mystery kind of thing of like, uh, you know, uh, does he really think that he's immortal or is he just saying that for the villains or is he just, you know, having a lend? Um, so uh, there's a lot I like about the Phantom character, which I would like to do now. This yeah. this frame that Germ's got yeah. on screen at the oh, moment um, is, is just unreal. The, the perspective that you offer from uh, an underwater Phantom looking back up and such a cocky bad guy, but you just he's got the skull mark on him already, and the phantom's bubbling up with rage. And it's just it's such an evocative, yeah. it's a wonderful panel. Oh, Congratulations on that alone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I also like in this the first issue, I don't think the phantom talks till about the second last page or something. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. Fire, he has his big car chase. Yeah, that might be it there. Oh! <laughs> that might be it. Shot, <laughs> and it's like, huh? <laughs> who, was, who was that masked man? That might be his only one. I love, um, uh, for all the Australians and uh, cricket fans, um, I love I love how you put Murphy's. Murphy's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Murphy's, yeah. We actually asked him if it was okay. Oh, did you? Oh, that was going to be my question. Today, yeah. <laughs> and but also that car chase. Uh, when we were in America, we actually did the route um, from where the car chase started to where it ends. And it's like we didn't film it, but we, we just heavily photographed it so that all the street signs would be in the right spot. And wow. I mean, cool. it's probably over-engineering, but I, I kind of <laughs> like doing that. Um, and yeah. also in Africa for a week, I went to um, spend a week in Zimbabwe uh, yeah. just to just check out what you know, the landscape really looked like and what the towns looked like um, because there is, the, if you wanted something to look authentic, it's always the little details, you know, otherwise you're just drawing a generic kind of, this is what I think Africa, an African city would look like. 
And um, but when you actually go there, it's you just notice little details and things that you never would have put in unless you'd sort of seen them. Yeah. I, we were just um, – our last podcast, uh, the last podcast we recorded was with um, Shane and Matt, and we were talking about those little details and the little Easter eggs and that little bit of care. And yeah. I, I, think, I think it does show because I think for those – who, who see it and all that, it just gives, well, for me, it just gives another appreciation of, of you know, of the art and, and stuff like that. Yeah. That's a great panel. I like how you've done the... Um... So, sorry, just to connection at the time, did you say, Glenn, that you went to Zimbabwe for a week so that you could draw this comic? You went there deliberately? Yeah. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Um. I know we just got no like the decision and the explaining to your family that you're going to Zimbabwe so you could get uh, visuals for a comic you're drawing. Well, you want some tips at the time. I had a um, a partner who I lived with, but we didn't have any kids or anything. And um, I was living in Fernanda, I think. And um, we we'd done this comic for Valiant Comics, and um, this is in the days when comics were just booming and as well as getting paid top dollar you'd get these great royalty checks and i think for this book we did for valley just out of nowhere we got this royalty check for about twenty five thousand bucks it was just came a, a courier just knocked on the door i remember i was talking to dave at the time and <laughs> just stopped the door and handed this envelope oh, hang on a sec uh dave uh, we just got paid twenty five thousand dollars american <laughs> and I went, I'm going to take this to the bank. I'm going to go to Africa for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I want to say Africa. Africa is freaking huge. I went to Zimbabwe, a very, very small part of Africa. Um, and uh, but yeah, it was. Yeah, then, like when we were doing the Batman story, that was set in Hong Kong. So I went to Hong Kong for a week <laughs> as well. Um, that was it. Was good. It was. It was great. Coming back with a million photos and, uh, yeah. Did you get to claim it back on tax? Bloody oath. (laughs) (laughs) Ain't no fool. (laughs) Mm, I wonder how we can do that, guys. (laughs) Maybe we should do this podcast, like, from Paris. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure our wives won't disagree with that as well. If they, I are. tried if, that. Yeah. <laughs> if we get to take them with us, I'm sure the wives will be happy. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm, I'm going to look at this story a lot with a lot more appreciation, just like how the fact is that you know you've been looking at things, you know, with with Africa and stuff. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Now. I think also from memory, was it the second comic or the third comic? There was a couple of pages that were printed out of order. Is that correct? Oh yeah, that was so funny. It was um, I think yeah, in the second and third one, they they reprint the same page twice, and so in the climax in the third book, suddenly this this page just appears, which makes no sense whatsoever, <laughs> and. I remember getting contacted by someone in Sweden, I think, and they were having this big argument where one person was saying, this is clearly a misprint. Yeah, that's the page that gets reprinted twice. Oh, and wow. so one, one person was saying, this is clearly a mistake, and another person was defending it as a kind of a, an artistic <laughs> work of genius. So like, you fool, don't you understand what they're saying? <laughs> it's at this moment that he goes back and... The, da, 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 da. <laughs> And what's really bad is that when you know it's um, a mistake and you've got someone who's really talking you up it's, <laughs> and, they're, and they're saying you're a genius and you've got to say, actually, it was, you know, the other guys, the, yeah, it was a mistake. <laughs> so I can't remember how I diplomatically got out of that. Wow, that's I, um, interesting. But I might have just told them, I might have just said, I might have just said, um, uh, something like, yeah, it was a mistake. But the thing is, it also works on many levels, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of read into it, whatever you like. Yeah, no. Nah. Um, it was, yeah, it's, it's definitely not, it's a definitely a different type of fandom than what um, uh, you would have, you would have grew up on. Yeah, but it I, is. I, I like, I, I enjoyed it when I read it. Um, what about you guys? Did you guys enjoy it? 
I remember um, seeing that, like seeing the comic at home, like up in Mildura, and then um, not being able to get issues two or three, and then finally I find issues two and three um, in a comic shop in Geelong, and the fellow wouldn't buy, wouldn't sell them to me. Why not? I don't know. Was saving them for somebody else, I guess. I, it took me until you know in the last decade for me to get all three <laughs> issues. <laughs> Oh, that sucks. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna not gonna lie to you, Glenn. I did not like them at the time, to be honest. They were probably um, a little bit too Marvel for me. I'm, I'm and I'm I'm the old man of the podcast and the for, most focused amongst it amongst us. I, I have had a renewed appreciation for them when I've read them over the last five or six years or so uh, I, when I've come back to them. I appreciate um, you saying that, and and I totally understand where you're coming from because I have sort of gone full circle myself and I agree with it 100%. Do you think it's just because as you get older? We... I don't know. I mean, I, I think <laughs> what happens no, is... Don't like, don't like that young stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that could be part of it, but I actually think I know my attitude to drawing and writing comics. I didn't write the 90s one, but my attitude to, I guess, being a comic creator has changed hugely and it actually changed because... I had that sort of meltdown in the 90s and went away from comics. Yeah. And that was really, really good because I think in the 90s, it was all about creating your own career and yeah. you wanted to be the centre of whatever book you did. So if someone said, you know, do Daredevil or whatever, instead of going, okay, I'm going to really get into the essence of Daredevil and, and try to really honour what the, uh, the char character is all about, my attitude would be more like, how can I do something to Daredevil so it really stands out and people go, oh, Glenn Lumsden, he's just radically changed Daredevil and made it his own. You know, that whole idea of making the character your own, whereas now it's like, how, how can I serve the character? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so instead of almost being blasé about the fabulous history of the Phantom and going, oh, I don't need to look at any of the old stuff, I'm just going to do you know, what I want, so that I stand out, so I'm front and centre. Um, now, I all I care about is honouring the Phantom and, and doing a Phantom that really uh, resonates with what I think the, the magic of the character is. Yep. And it's a totally different approach. And, um, and I, I guess, I mean, we all go through that phase, especially in the early years of your career, where yep. you are very, I guess, ego, self-conscious. It's yeah. all about proving yourself. Yep. But now I just don't need that, to do that. I don't feel that urge anymore. Um, I do feel more like um, it's a privilege to be allowed to do the Phantom. And mm. I just want to do, I just want to do the Phantom. I don't want to yeah. change it. I don't want to radically alter him I just want to do the thing that makes him so wonderful uh, I'm sure so well, yeah, Glenn um, we sort of half touched on it but I don't think we ever actually pointedly asked the question how did you come to be aware of the fan when did you first start reading comics and uh, did you said in the newspaper was that it yeah I guess so in the show bags and the Royal Easter show yeah right okay. um, I started reading what was, can, do you remember your first story? What was the artist that, and uh, the era that you first really engaged? Well, oh, it's hard, I can't remember. Because in the show bags, of course, you know, one day you'd get a, a, a Cy Barry fan and the next week it would be back to Wilson McCoy and you get, you know, so it just jumped around. Um, so I can't remember. It would have been either Cy Barry or Wilson McCoy. What's funny too is that, again, this is like – because Cy Barry was more the DC Marvel style of art I was used to, I used to love him, couldn't stand Wilson McCoy stuff. <laughs> now, now I still love Cy Barry. I love McCoy. I just love him. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe as you get older, you get more, you get Appreciate, less, yeah. you know, yeah. jid, you know, it's so like everything has to conform to my rules. It's more like, hey, it's a whole world of art out there and different styles. And, um, yeah, you, I just – I don't get upset anymore about – because as a kid, kids are shocking with um, – especially comic fans. If 
they just re be, um, react to everything viscerally. So they'll just look at your art. And this has happened to me. I'll look at my art and I just go, I hate your art. I hate it. I hope you never draw another <laughs> comic again. I hope you die. You know, they're, they're that. Well, I'm just going like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and they, they, but it's just like they either love you or they freaking hate you, man. It's like yeah, um, yeah, yeah. it doesn't seem to be an in-between. And they don't mind telling you either, you know. Um, but then as you get older, I think you just maybe you lose that uh, fanaticism and you just sort of go, live, 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 hey, you know, there's all the different art styles and it's cartoony and there's realistic and, you know. Um, and also even art that I don't particularly, um, doesn't work for me, I still don't hate it. I just yeah, sort of go, no, that's not my bad. And you can find something that you appreciate out of it as yeah, well. Yeah. So long as, like, I appreciate, like, I do have standards that must be met. So, for instance, you know, consistency of style and a clear, you know, a control over your tools and things like that. I don't care whether you're doing cartoony or realistic or whatever. Um, if you don't display those basic skills, that craftsmanship, I, I have a problem with that. But if you're, you know, if you're clearly skilled, then, you know, to each their own. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I think we've, we've discussed it on the podcast many times with many creators and, and, and fans there, how they've all said basically this, all, all, a lot of them have said the same, how they don't appreciate Wilson McCoy until later in life. I, I'm yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, at first, it's you know, a common theme. It really is. Yeah, it is. And and I think there's I think there's a lot in there. I think because we were, again the podcast we're talking uh, that we last recorded. Matt and Shane Shane were were both just talking about the the like there's the simplicity in Wilson McCoy's art and stuff, but there's every line is there for a reason, and every line is used to maximize the effect and, and and stuff like that and i think as a kid or as a as a younger reader you don't appreciate that until you've mature and yeah yeah i think um like i know that the uh, silver age of comics in the 60s uh saw a transition from i guess stuff that was more like wilson mccoy in terms of its um simplicity and it evolved, like there was a point like artists like Neil Adams and Jim Steranko came in and they introduced a, a more, much more realistic style of art which just blew people's minds. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there was a rejection of what had gone before. So suddenly you hated all that cartoony stuff. It's like, yeah. immature, take it away, it's childish. You know, I'm into this sort of... And, and Cy Barry definitely fills into that more, yeah. you know... Uh, that, that second category yeah um so maybe that's part of the reason why mccoy got rejected uh and then after a while you just realize it doesn't matter man it's like it, 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 uh, and this is one of the great things about um the internet um is that it's kind of made accessible all the periods of art all at the same time so it's not just like you know you grew up with this sort of music and your parents grew up with a totally different sort of music and you don't even know about that. It's like you've got all of the, all the different epochs all together and yeah. you can just jump from one to the other. You see the connections. You see yeah. the evolution of, of comics and art and storytelling and stuff. It's a chain. It's, it's not like one person just invented something in the 50s and then someone invented a new thing in the 60s. They're, they're linked. They're all clearly linked by people who were influenced by their predecessors. Um, and, uh, I mean, like, the, you could argue that all comic art started with um, Hal Foster, Milt Caniff, and Alex Raymond back in the 30s. But even those guys, their influences came from book illustrations, like pulp magazine books and yeah. stuff, which is why the very early Phantoms by Moore look like they could easily be out of a, a big boy's adventure annual or something. Like yeah. You could almost imagine them with text and then just like the illustration, you know, they were that sort of style of Illo. And then as comics progressed, it started to develop its own very clear style of, you, know, you look at it and you go, yeah, that's definitely a comic book. That belongs in a comic book, not in any, any other, yeah, form, yeah. you know, 
Definitely. And then you've also got like the, in the 50s and 60s with the space age, it was very minimal with the art style as well. It was very minimal yep. um, lines and very smooth and very impactful and all that. And that was represented in the comics of what we saw with McCoy. It's like fascinating, that. like the, the history of comics, um, both in terms of the storytelling and the visuals, is, is like a history of of civilization, you know, it's, you can see um, it really reflects the more mores of the time and and the stylistic, um, uh, the aesthetics of the era, how they all sort of change. Um, it's absolutely, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. But um, that's why, yeah, I guess coming back to what we were talking about, it's very hard to just sort of you know, pull Wilson McCoy out of the chain and go, yeah. you know, without the whole thing falling apart it's like yeah. you need mccoy in there and i also love those really early cy barry stories where they obviously told him can you stick to wilson mccoy's style because that was really common in those days yeah. one artist left like uh, with rip kirby when alex raymond died john prentice drew like alex raymond for about the first two years mm -hmm. and and then as you see each strip slowly john prentice starts to emerge yeah. and he didn't really do full john prentice for about maybe three, four years into the strip. And um, I'd say Cy Barry probably looked like Wilson McCoy for a year, maybe a year and a half. He yeah. got, Cy Barry got his first couple of uh, drawings rejected that he had to redraw because that wasn't Wilson McCoy enough. There you go. There you go. It's, it's really interesting hearing the backstories as well because yeah. often people will say things like, oh, those early Cy Barry stories are terrible. And they have no idea that. He was under a direction to draw yes. like Wilson McCoy. Otherwise, we're not printing it. Yep. So, what do you do? You know, it, it, mm. it goes to show the beauties in the eye of the beholder, though, because I know people who will swear black and blue that the early Cybarries were the absolute best. Um, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> people say it took his while to evolve. Other people say he was in his heyday immediately. Yeah, yeah. Art, uh, art depends on who's looking at it. <laughs> yep. Mm. And also, I think an important. Um, thing too, obviously with comics, is um, how enjoyable the stories are because uh, yeah. it's a package, you know, and uh, like some of those really early more stories um, are, are fabulous. It's the whole package is, is wonderful. It's really pulpy and sometimes I, I find more, some of his art is, is gorgeous, like almost Alex Raymondy, yeah. and then I'd finally get the, the odd panel, which are all clunkers. I'm going, yeah. but as a as a body of work, I'd go. This is, you know, I would read this any day of the week. Um, and then, you know, there are other stories where, if the story's a bit, eh, I even if the art's kind of good, I just think, yeah, it still doesn't really hit me in the feels, you know. Mm. Um, now I have another question. Yep. Um, I'm, for those who are on audio, I'm holding up some cards. It's not going to work the best because they're foil cards. <laughs> but these, <laughs> they, <laughs> these are from the Phantom Gallery Intrapred um, set called the Year One or the Y series. Now, there's six of them. Yep. Now, this is Year One. Uh, year One. So it's it's got the first three are from your Marvel story. And yep. the bottom three are uh, new panels. Yep. Now, this is um, the bottom ones. That I'm just going to read it out. Preview yep. from the Phantom Year One, The Devil Sands, a two-part trading card series in development for Intrapret, drawn by Glenn Lumsden, written and coloured by David DeVeries. Now, did that ever happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> That was a long run up for a very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These things, but um, I can't even remember. I can't remember that what you just read. But um, what happens is you get into these meetings and you go out for some long lunch, and everyone gets overly excited about. Oh, we could do this. We could do that. And, oh, blah, blah, blah. And, and people sort of jump the gun, and and then later on, it's like, uh oh, yeah, do you want to do that? No, uh, let's not do that. <laughs> I, just, I just think yeah, announcing things too early is just like, 
don't do it. You know, but, yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, uh, there's we've we've had that we've we've said that a very few a, a lot of times on the podcast. Like <laughs> until it's ready, until it's printed, maybe don't tell everyone about it because then yeah. Yeah. us us upset. Uh, immature fandom fans who have got no <laughs> patience. Uh, no patience will be going, where's our comic? Where's this? Where's yeah, this? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I must admit, I actually, I have actually asked Glenn this question previously. I'm not sure if yeah. you remember. But it was never on record or on the podcast, so I had to ask that question. So do you remember anything about what was the story ever written? Was the story ever plotted? Or All I can remember is that because we had Merv Hughes you know, likeness as the villain in the miniseries. And we were at some comic conventions and they were getting other uh, footy stars and things like that to turn up. And I remember we had some lunches with various ones. And so we were going, hey, we could make the villain or the, the, the um, guest star this you know, rugby league dude or this rugby union guy or whatever. And um, so I, I know that was part of the story. It was going to be one of the um, guest stars or something in the, in the story was going to be, I think, Mel Meninga or, or I can't remember who. Um, he's a rugby and, player, so he's not that important. What's that? He's a rugby player. No, <laughs> Boy Lewis would have been chomping at the bit, wouldn't he? <laughs> What's that? Boy <laughs> Lewis would have been chomping at the bit to be involved in a phantom story. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, bad I, I don't even know if these things were actually discussed with them or whether it was just like, <laughs> like hey, that's Mel Meninga. Maybe we can put Mel Meninga in a fan story. <laughs> hey, let's announce it on the back of the trading card. <laughs> it would have gone bananas in Queensland, I can tell you, because Mel Meninga is a huge, <laughs> yep. a huge name here. Uh, Jim may not recognise him really, but... <laughs> no, no I, I agree with you. Uh, get, I'm uh, just winding up all of the rugby followers on this podcast uh, out of our maybe uh, 20 listeners. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, so we talked about, um, so we'll skip a decade or two. So we talked about how you had your um, uh, your burnout or yeah. your, 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 your area where you didn't do much uh, comics. Then yeah. your first... Uh, entry back into the Phantom was actually not with Fru, but it was actually with Herms. Uh, Hermes, he actually did a cover for that. that. It was before that. It was, um, there's a comic shop in Sydney called King's Comics, and yes. uh, George Vlastaris, um, who owned it, he, way back in the days when we were doing our own comic called Cyclone, he used to put ads in Cyclone. He was like basically our one and only um, sponsor. And so, yeah, we've known George for ages. You know, I think he was either he was coming up for a birthday, or maybe maybe King's Comics was coming up for a like 30, 40 years or something. And they contacted me and said, We're doing all these bits of art for George. Could you do something? And so I did a mock-up Phantom but cover like the early Fru ones, you know. Um, okay. except it had something to do with King's Comics written in it. And um, so I did that. And then after that, Glenn Ford, I don't know, Glenn must have seen that. And then he rung me and said, would you like to do a variant cover? This is, I didn't even know what variant covers were. I was like, <laughs> what? a valiant cover? No, no, a variant cover. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would like to. I understand the word. <laughs> um, so did that for Hermes. And then um, I think Glenn said, I want to do, I want to bring back Giant Size Phantom. And he told me the whole deal with Catman and Shadow and all these other characters that Free used to do. And um, I, I sort of looked at all the old covers and I went, oh, this is so up my street. Yeah. And I love doing those covers. In fact, I just finished the latest one yesterday because um, the deadline's for tomorrow is tomorrow. And uh, I always... <laughs> I'm sure Glenn well, I wish happy. my year nine English students were as diligent with their deadlines as you are, mate. <laughs> What's that then? I wish Sorry? my year nine English students were as diligent with their deadlines. It's due tomorrow, but you still finished it yesterday. What's going on? <laughs> well, the thing is, I thought I was going to finish it like a week ago, but it just kept on going on and on and on. And, and I'd sort of go, I'd look at it every morning and go, oh, that character's terrible. Oh, just redraw the bloody character. And, uh, um, but I finally got to finish yesterday. 
And my my test is uh, because by the time you've been looking at a piece of art for too long, you lose all sense of clear judgment. You know, yeah. you might draw something and go, that looks fine. You go away, have a sleep, wake up the next morning, open it up in the computer and look at it and just go, oh my God. You know, like the head is insanely too big or you left one hand off or something. Like that. <laughs> Things which you just think, how did I miss that? But it's because you've just been focused, hyper-focused for so long. Um, yeah, you need that little downtime. So um, I finished the, the cover yesterday, I looked at it this morning and just went, ah, that's perfect. Well, like perfect as in I can't see anything wrong with it. Um, sure. Or in a year's time, I will see stacks <laughs> wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the very first giant size cover I did. Um, I thought, I'm so, this is the best thing I've ever done. I'm, I'm just so proud of this. And now I look at it and I go, oh, a bit wrong there. <laughs> so, which is good because that means that my eyes are getting better. Yeah. And um, not my eyes, but my eye for, you know, judging things um, is getting better. And, but I still, I still, I still love that cover, um, but I know I can do better. So that's I'm good. Just, I'm just going to go through some of them now yeah. um, while we're talking and stuff like that. There's a real retro feel to them and um, you, you seem like you, you, you have fun doing these I covers. I love it. I love it. This is, you know, this is my happy place, you know, where heroes, the comic heroes are kind of, um, they're they're more heroic, you know. They're they're good, you know. They're, there's um, uh, admirable. They have admirable qualities, which I I really like. And I guess with that, there's a certain naivety. I don't know. If naivety is the right word because it makes it sound like they're dumb. Yeah. But um, yeah. except um, Shadow in this one, well, everyone else is doing the hard work. He's just uh, you think very James of- Bond. Very yeah, he's just like, just knocking off a bottle there, yeah. and uh, you know, these poor shield guys. fifty-eight. Hmm. Yeah. I'll take this one home. These poor guys are lifting the heavy safe, and yes. he's just like, "Whoa, this is a good bottle. I'll uh, I'll keep this one." But, <laughs> but, but meanwhile, meanwhile, the Phantom, Shadow's, Shadow's done all the hard work of getting in to the embassy, <laughs> yeah. and, and meanwhile, the Phantom's coming out of a secret uh, passageway up the chimney. So <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what's your process uh, with your uh, covers, Glenn? Um, I heard you, you mentioned earlier um, about the computer. Have you always used the computer or, or as soon as the computer um, came to be uh, I don't know, more accepted or more um, easily accessible, um, did you jump on it straight away or were you pens and paper for a long time? Or It was like, it was like a, um, there was a hybrid period where so I used to do everything old school, you know, brush and paper and ink and a drawing table. And then the computer came along and I would still draw um, the old way, but then scan it in and then do a little bit of fiddling on the computer, neatening things up or, you know, straight, perfectly straight lines or circles or whatever. And then over time, I just found I could do more and more on the computer. And now that they've got, you know, Cintiq drawing tablets. So, like, my Cintiq's just over there here and like here's like the pen and you just draw straight on the screen and it's great. You never run out of ink, you never run out of paper. And it's, and, and also what you, what you draw is digital. So it gets sent to the printer where it gets printed digitally. So there isn't any more um, photocopying or, or, or sort of bromiding or whatever, because each st- every step of the way where they, do a photo of a photo of a photo to get it to a plate is a degradation of the, the image. Yeah. Um, and not to mention, you know, sort of the colours that can be wildly out, mm-hmm. whereas now what you see is what you get. You know, like I, I'm 99% confident that if I colour something here, that's exactly the colour that I'll see when it gets printed, which is terrific. Whereas in the past, in the 90s, I'd be 50% confident. Oh wow! You know, yeah, and then they might even print a page in the wrong comic and out of order. Several times over, exactly. (laughs) Um, So uh, this is uh, a question we we have to ask, and I'm sure uh, a lot of fans will will be wanting to know. Um, So none of your Phantom Free covers are done uh, traditionally. No, but what I wouldn't mind doing because. 
I do have just recently bought a drawing table again and I want to get set up. I really want to do one-off hard copies of the covers um, and just really take my time doing it, doing it nice and large. Um, and then just so that there's a hard copy original and see if anyone wants to buy them because it just seems like, yeah, great. I mean, like, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think you just saw saw several people quickly uh, jumping on uh, email and Facebook to uh, put up their hands for one. Um, I've put up my hand for one. Uh, Dan, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just reckon that, um, I mean, in order to supplement my comics addiction, I'm going to, I could either take on draw and wine labels or take on phantom commissions. And yeah. I'm just thinking, Phantom Commission. It's like it just, I'd so much prefer to be doing that than some bloody label for a jam jar or something, you know, or some logo for a cafe or whatever. Um, so, Glenn, just to clarify, you you just said about um, doing hard copy versions of your covers. So you're saying you go back and have a look at the finished digital that you did with the cover and then reproduce that on uh, with people yeah, as a one-off? How, yeah, as a one-off. So it would be just like, there's a digital original and this is the paper original and that's it. There's no, there's no yep. more of these. That's it. Um, Cause I think that is, it's, it makes it special, you know, if it's just like, yeah, sure. yeah if it's just like, you know, sort of print off a thousand posters or whatever. Um, it's not the same. And I know myself from like bits of original comic art that I've picked up in my travels in America there's something great about the texture of the paper, the liquid paper, mistakes. The you know you can see yeah. a bit of pencil that didn't quite get rubbed out, and it's like yeah. a real living thing. Yeah. Um, whereas digital is never going to have that warmth or um, hum humanity, or you know that that you know, that warm quality, um, which is makes it really special. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I you know I collect. Um, original art as well, and um, I'm looking at. I got a couple of pieces just to the to my side over there, and and you're right. You know, I, I love all of everything you've said about it as well. That's what appeals to me as well. So um, yeah. definitely down for a cover. So um, uh, so if people are interested, um, we might as well get this out of the way. We normally ask this at the end of the um, podcast, but what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, just on Facebook. Just message me. Per, you know. Do the little messagey thing, and um, yeah, absolutely happy as Larry. So, did you read Giant Size back back in the day? That was before my time because I think Giant Size was fifties, I think, was it? Yeah. And I wasn't born till sixty four, so um, uh, so I don't think I've actually read a an original Giant Size. I would love to track them down, and I'm always like going on eBay every now and then, and and they're like. like 300 bucks, and like, uh, the cover slightly detached and missing, uh, 300 bucks. Mm. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think I'd love to do is next time I'm, I'm in Sydney, go to the through offices and just check out all their, because I think they've got like albums of just yep. about everything, the originals, and they, I think they're in perfect condition. That would be, I'd love to do that. Just flick through all their, you know, uh, not just giant size, but um, I really love the, character the shadow um and uh i also like phantom ranger the cowboy although those first few issues are diabolical they're so bad they're so <laughs> badly drawn it's just like jaw-droppingly because i remember having this talk with glenn ford when we were just talking about giant size and he said i don't know like part of me wants to start with it you know the first issue of phantom ranger first issue of Shadow, and just, you know, do every issue. But he said, on the other hand, the first three issues of Phantom Ranger are like, Wah! so it's like customer has to find, has to grit their teeth and get get through those before they start getting some artwork, which is a bit more professional. Yeah. So I think he ended up biting the bullet and going with the, oh! um, so I don't know. I don't know whether that was the, right move or not it's all done I think, yeah i think in some of the giant size comics um i can't remember if it's kevin or, or glenn but they talk about how like 
the, the, the deadline was crazy. Like, they had like one week to. I know. Like, it was story. insane. It was crazy. <laughs> Um, and you know, like, like one week to do a story. You you talked to us before that, um, you know, the three Marvel yeah. took you over a year to do, yeah. to do that. Um, that's so I, I can kind of probably understand why, a- absolutely, absolutely. And then this is why, you know, I, I sort of like, um, I've learned to be not so sort of like, you know, I guess, quick to judge, you know, mm. when you see art that you go, know, yeah, um. But then you sort of this guy was doing a comic a week, like for years. And yeah. you're going, how the hell do you do a 24 page comic in a week? It's just, probably just straight inking, I reckon. No I pencils, or yep. Yep. it's probably just well, straight inking. And they were writing and lettering the story as well. So yeah. I don't know when they got time to think up the next story, but you can really forgive them for, you know, repeating face shots or flipping things or mm-hmm. silhouettes. Notice a lot of the Three characters have no faces. It'll be like the Raven, just a mask, shadow, just a black face. Because faces take a long time to draw. Yeah. You're gonna have a character with just Zippo face. You just saved yourself probably half an hour <laughs> per panel drawing. So did you did you know about these characters, or did Glenn give you like digital copies to like read and 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 like learn about when you did the covers, and then getting into your story death dive. He, he gave me um, digital copies to read, but also I do remember when I was a kid getting a, a comic of The Shadow in a secondhand shop in Forbes when I was up there visiting my pop. And because um, I was used to The Shadow, the American Shadow, the, you know, <laughs> and I'm going through the comics and I'm going, what the hell is this? And it was like <laughs> the Australian Shadow. I'm going, that's not The Shadow. And I bought it and read it just going like, I just didn't get it. Didn't compute. And um, but now in hindsight, I know what was going on. And I, I wish I still had that that comic, but I don't. Um, but yeah, so Glenn just gave me digital copies of the stories and stuff, so that I knew what the costumes looked like, and I could uh, read, you know, get a get a feel for for um what they were like. And since then, I have in my travels picked up some originals when they when they weren't too expensive. Um, it's like on eBay and stuff like that. And I've had some people send me some originals. Um, so, yeah, yeah. but I, I, I love those characters. And I know that um, the hardest thing with Giant Size is that um, it's uh, you're trying to get Phantom fans to read characters yeah. that aren't Phantom. And I, I know that that's going to be a hard thing to do. And so I thought the idea, a good idea would be to have stories where the Phantom teamed up, just short little ones, Phantom teamed up with one of the characters where the Phantom was still the major hero in the story and the other character was clearly subordinate and the Phantom did all the major heroic things, cool things, but the other guy still got a chance to do some as well. But yeah. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't trying to supplant the Phantom supremacy, but it was more just like, Trying to have a, I wanted readers to read and go, I really enjoyed that. That yep. shadow character is not so bad. You know, yep. I hated him before, but now, you know, prepared to maybe give him another go. And yep. maybe in the future, then you could do another little story where maybe the Phantom just appears at the beginning to give the shadow his orders. And then the rest of the story is largely the shadow by himself. And then maybe you could just do a solo shadow story. Yeah. We've talked about that on the podcast several times, just about how, um, you know, I, I think on the podcast we're on the record saying that, oh, we're not sure about this giant size idea and all that. And then I think the news stories are important because it um, it really helps you, uh, it, you know, you read the newer stories probably first because, you know, you've got art from, you know, Phil Mang, Shane Foley, yourself and, 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 and stuff like that. And then you kind of like, oh, it's not too bad. And and, you, and we've all done it. Like, um, I think from memory, Stephen, The Raven was one of your favourites. Raven's a favourite yeah. of mine. I'm still, Catman has, has come on board now since uh, since Shane Foley's, was it Scorpio, Scorpio, Scorpius series? Mm-hmm. I didn't mind it, but um, I hated Catman when, when I 
when he first came out. And it was like you were saying before, um, I didn't mind the um, the Phantom Ranger stuff, but the you know the early the early issues of that, but um, the early issues of Catman, it, it was just. <laughs> I, I didn't like it at all. Uh, I know. I no one likes cat man. On. <laughs> on. Talk to someone. Just go, cat man. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it was just. It was. Uh, it was just a, a home brand version of a, of a few different. For Tick, you know, got the Phantom. You know, his sidekick's name's Kit. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the cat, no, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> Sorry yeah. for all the cat fans out there who have stumbled across the Phantom podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Dan, did you have a favourite? I'm sure both of those people are going to turn off in disgust. <laughs> 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 um, no, when I started reading Giant Size, uh, the Shadow was the one that I and I, I feel like I might have mentioned it at the time, but um, certainly the Shadow was the one that I um, enjoyed the most. Um, I've taken longer to come on board with the Raven. Still not a big. Uh, I can't get al- alongside the. Uh, what's the the medieval one? Oh, the Sir Falcon. Sir Falcon. The Falcon. I, I can't really get a hold of him. But yeah, I, I the Death Dive story, Glenn. I really enjoyed mm. this, and it was the. Um, in all due respect to Shane, but I really enjoyed this team up. Um, probably the most of any team up in the in Giant Size so far. Uh, it's just a really Good story, and for, and because it had all of those phantom tropes that you talked about before, um, right at the very start of the podcast, um, you know this this is a real phantom pirate at sea underdog, yeah. people getting blown up. He's underwater, you know. It, it was just a ripper from start to finish. Fantastic! I'm so happy to hear that because um, that's what I was trying to to do is is to. Um, I, I wanted to have the Phantom as that kind of that that rock, you know, that that totally dependable guy who, in any situation, is keeps his cool. Yep. And um, and so, you know, the Shadow, by comparison, is kind of almost like almost a bit of a bromance kind of crush. <laughs> like, oh, this guy's incredible, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Which which sort of you know raises the Phantom up. But also, hopefully, um, makes people like the shadow a bit more because he's not upstaging the phantom in any way. Yeah. Um, and another thing I like doing in uh, stories is trying to have like villains who are kind of they you know, they do bad things, but they have a side to them as well. You can kind of sort of understand why they're doing what they're doing. They're not just you know it's not just that cardboard two dimensional villainy. It's like yeah. But they all still need to be blown up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still need to be blown up. But um, I've noticed your shadow also has uh, facial features. You were just telling us that. Uh, yeah, I know because it's just really blur drawing a character with no face. <laughs> you can't, they can't look like they're smiling or quizzical or there's no nuance. Yeah, it's like, like this one here. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of just, I mean, the whole idea of a latex mask that adheres. Totally to your face. Anyway, is just, just like ridiculous. And and what about the hair? Is the hair part of the mask, or does it just magically go to the hairline and vanish in? I don't know. Well, we're hoping you could explain that to us. <laughs> also, I don't care because it's comics, and that's what I love about comics. Yeah. I mean, like I also like this world where the shadow meets the phantom, and it's, there's no they don't have to explain anything. It's just like. You're obviously a superhero. I'm a superhero. Let's go and save these people on the boat. Boom. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a world where, because this is like um, in the, the early Phantom stories as well, is that people would discover that the Phantom was like, you know, on a boat or on a train or whatever, and they just go, oh, there's this guy with a mask and a costume in this room. And it was like just, oh, right, okay. <laughs> no one goes... No, no, that is insane. There's a guy with a mask. <laughs> the costume is room. No, it's just like, well, he must be a hero. So <laughs> let him be a hero. Be and a hero. Uh, I like that kind of world. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it is make believe, but it's kind of joyously. Um, I don't know. It, it just takes me back to a more innocent time yeah. where yeah. the heroes they wear costumes, live with it. That's the nature of the world. I, <laughs> and I, like, 
I like this bit here where it looks like they're almost having a hand, uh, like a hand grip type of contest. You know, like when you have like two guys and they're trying to show their their strength by who can sh- who can shake the squeeze the other guy's hand harder <laughs> and stuff you know, like I, that. I just remember that my dad, uh, when he taught me to handshake when I was a little kid, he said, "Glenn, no one wants to squeeze wet uncooked sausages." <laughs> he said, Look him in the eye, firm handshake, not a bone crusher, but a firm handshake. And that's what you do. And I've always remembered that. And and I, in my time, have definitely had handshakes with people which have been the, the uncooked sausages. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so these two guys look each other in the eye, boom. Firm what a, and what I think is incredible about that, Glenn, and you've said it, the, the, the two characters are looking at each other in the eye. But it's also at around the hands, it's seven lines um, that you've just gone, dun, 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 dun. And that, that that adds that that emphasis. Yeah. It's it's brilliant. It's 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 sort of manly without being um, chauvinist, yeah. because I um, yeah. appreciate that a lot of what are seen as male qualities um, in the past have been not admirable qualities. You know, like the, the sexism and chauvinism and being overly aggressive and stuff like that, but. What I would like to focus on, and I think the Phantom is a great example of this, is that there are traditional manly qualities which are actually very upstanding and charming yes. and good, and you can be proud to pass that on to your son that yep. you know, this is the way a gentleman behaves, and without you know without being ridiculous about it and sort of you know yeah. treating women like they're all like made of porcelain and whatever and having to overdo it. But yep. I, I just think there's a nice middle ground where you can be quietly a, a man and it means something that's good rather than yep. always being associated with something that's a downer. You know, yeah. like he talked over the woman, he, you know, was being a bully. Blah, blah, blah. No, he was being a gentleman who... Um, you know, sort of knew when to help and when to stand back. And, you know, they're, they're sort of the qualities I admire. I remember their qualities that I really admired in my father and their qualities I admire in The Phantom, um, which I would like to have in, in the stories, you know? Yeah. Um, and as the, as the father of two daughters, you know, that's what you want them to eventually, you know, marry and end up with is someone... Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying the Phantom, but someone who you know who is strong, but is also you know is gentle and, and that's right. Yeah, yeah, and a true gentleman. Yeah, yeah. and and um, uh, that um, I, I find, if I can get that sort of ethos in mm. every Phantom story I do, that to me would be um, a big box ticked yep. in my you know wish list of. Uh, you know, things I would like to do in stories I write. Yeah. I love this cross-hatching underwater as well. That's another thing the computer's great for because you do, like, a few lines and then you go cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste and build up a tone, <laughs> whereas in the past I would draw every bloody line into the <laughs> and you would just go cross-eyed. And the good thing too is yeah, I can do one of those... Um, series of, of cross hatches and keep them so the next time I have to do another scene, a similar <laughs> scene, I can use the old cross hatching, recombine them in different ways to create different shading effects. But it just means that um, it saves you a lot of time and it makes you more inclined to do those things. Whereas yeah. if you have to do them all by hand, you sort of go, oh, do I really need a cross hatch pattern? Couldn't I just like maybe go black, you know, just have it all black or whatever? <laughs> One, one thing that you're not cut and pasting, and I don't know what page or, or issue we're looking at, June, but we've been sitting on this one for a while, which is where um, the Shadow and Phantom are both um, buddy breathing on the regulator uh, yeah. underwater. And just the swimming in synchronicity, like the uh, just the posing of the two characters with the way their arms and legs are kicking and swimming, and they're just, yeah, you, you're on it there, June. They're just, they are swimming together. You've, you've absolutely That's, yeah. done. They're a team. That, that image. They're a cohesive yeah. team. And that's not a cut and paste. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're a cohesive team of heroes on a mission and they, they share more or less the same 
you know, goals and stuff. And um, the same air in this case. Yeah, the same air. Yep. And is that the element of like uh, trust, like the, the shadow says it, but it's like you couldn't ask for a better, like buddy breathing depends on trust. Yeah. And you couldn't get a more trustworthy partner than the Phantom. The Phantom. Yeah. yeah. So and of course, this was all pre COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Underwater, we'd wash it away anyway. There was no sanitizing it after every time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just wondering, Glenn. Like, um, we know you've done a, a deep dive story, but uh, and we know that you've been an artist for a long time. When, when did you start? Have you always been writing stories, or is it just a new thing that's come along? Well, the funny thing is, is that I, um, when I started drawing comics, I used to always write plays and things and um there was a period in the really early days when I, we were doing the self-published comics in sydney i was also writing plays and having a bit of success getting those plays put on and so i was always a bit like do i want to draw do i want to write i don't know i love doing both but then when i teamed up with dave devries because he was a he used to do writing and drawing and coloring and stuff so we kind of doubled up and so we just decided, well, you write, I'll draw, and you colour, and I'll do the lettering. And it seemed like a, a good way of divvying it up. But I guess the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the downside of that is, well, I didn't think this at the time, certainly, but the downside is that you don't get to write anymore. And I love writing. So um, this has been another great thing about having this uh, chance with Fru to do The Phantom is that I get to write as well as draw, and writing is something that I, I love doing, um, and I get a chance to do the whole box and dice the way I uh, envisage it. And that's another thing with um, when you work with someone else, um, even if it's really enjoyable, there it's not the same as working by yourself because it's inevitable that you're both going to have to compromise. And I know David DeVries, he had to put up with me <laughs> constantly, you know, changing things. And he was going, oh, did you have to change that? And I was like, yeah, I really wanted to draw that. And go, okay. But then, you know, he might write something that I go, yeah, maybe we could write it that way. And he's going, no, no, this is the way I want to write it. So I guess there always is that feeling of, you know, despite the, the positives, there's always that feeling of one day I'd just like to do the whole thing myself. Um, and now I'm getting a chance to do that. And I'm uh, absolutely loving it. I just, mm. you know. Mm. I'm the happiest I think I've ever been. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. always good. Yeah. It's that, that happy phantom in, in its true sense, really, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Happy phantom. <laughs> Very well done. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm on to it. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I was, I was wondering, because the way you, um, you're you talking about the characters, it, so much depth and, you know, the reason why, you, um, the way you planned things out and, and the, the the thinking behind the storylines so he's not late to the party here on on mm. on his writing he's been doing this for a while he's had the ideas for a while so yeah when you said you're a, you know, a, a player i thought ah yeah here we go and um but but you worked with david for a while like not just on phantom stuff very long time yeah i reckon about almost 20 years wow um, um lee, lee fork was quite famously um he considered yeah. himself more a playwright than a comic book artist so or author yeah, sorry yeah. so that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I do happen to have something of yours that's not Phantom. Um, I picked it up uh, from the library when they were they were clearing stuff out, so I got it on the cheap. If I'm being honest, <laughs> um, but I didn't I didn't realise it was yours. I, I've got it for the title, and um, then later on I saw the name there. I thought that name's familiar. Then I checked it out and thought, ah, oh, yes, they're, they're Phantom guys. So I'll hold it up to the camera there. Oh, hang on. Let me stop sharing this so okay. you can actually just bear with me. Oh, I'm pressing on the wrong buttons. All right. Talk, Steve. Right there. Round the twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Round the twist. Yep. So, um, you know, being a, a kid of the 80s and 90s, knew Paul Jennings and Round the Twist. So when I saw the, uh, the iconic version of Round the Twist, I thought, I've got to have that. Then, um, yeah, looking through it, that heart seems kind of familiar. Then, yeah, have a look down the bottom. And there we have uh, Glenn Lumsden and... Uh, David DeVries. So, yep. yeah, it's not just phantom work I've got of yours. It's, it's, I, just no, in fact, I think yeah. before we started the phantom, um, that was one of the books we had to do to get done so we could go on to the phantom. And, uh, of course, Penguin uh, books, it was Penguin Australia. So 
it just happened by coincidence that while we were trying to get work in America, we also got contacted by Penguin Australia. And um, so and we said, yep, we'd love to do that. So we, we did that. And I think we did that in the, and we had to do the Eternal Warrior yearbook for Valiant. And then we could start Phantom. I think that's the order it went in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we were bloody busy in those <laughs> in the 90s. It was, uh, it made my head spin. I don't know how I got through it, to be honest, because um, it was just endless. And, and you, it was always chasing a deadline. And it was just, I don't think I ever had any time off. Unless I, you know, went to Africa. <laughs> you know, that was work related, though. Don't forget. Yeah, I know, but you were sitting in the drawer and eyeballs bleeding and you know, pulling your hair out. Yeah. So I guess that's one of the reasons why you asked Glenn that you want to do phantom stuff, but there's no deadline. Yep. And, and even Glenn, though your giant size covers do have deadlines, I. Yeah, I know, but they're like, <laughs> in the future. it's like every three months, so <laughs> it's like not a problem. Um, I still managed to go up to the <laughs> – I still had a few close calls, though. Um, <laughs> that's usually when – like when I was trying to get Death Dive finished and I had to get a cover done and then there'd be the odd trading cards as well and, and then suddenly I'd find myself just working around the clock and, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I just – I can't um, – I can't handle the stress anymore, you know. Like in the 90s, it was like cool to not sleep for three days. It's like, oh, I just – you know, just been working for 72 hours and having any sleep. And, all that. and now I can't think of anything worse. It's like torture. And I'm, yeah. I'm sure your wife probably agrees with that as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and it really affects me physically. Like, um, yeah, I just get shaky and uh, nervous and just uh, mm -hmm. so the, um, the, the, the deadlines that Glenn sets me are just sweet as. And it's he's fabulous. He's so he's fantastic. Um, I can't say enough good things about Glenn. Glenn, I need to ask um, a few of your. Yep. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I just need to ask a, a couple of your um, giant size covers in particular have been turned into posters that were produced, and um, the folio series as well that yeah. um, your arts appeared in. Have, have you have you, you gathered those yourselves? You, were, you, were you happy with the way that they came out? Yeah, Glenn Noyes sends me a copy of all, all those things. Yeah, in fact, I've got um, some of those prints. I've got them framed and on the living room walls. Um, the little folio thing, I, I actually thought that was too small. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted it to um, have the logos and stuff on because I actually find, to my mind, a comic cover isn't a comic cover unless it's got, like, the Spider-Man logo or the Phantom or whatever it happens to be and the, the little Comics Code Authority and the price, the date, all that stuff is Stuck intrinsic on, yeah. to making it a comic cover. Proper. Without that, because when you're designing it, you leave blank spots for those logos to go. Yeah. So when it's printed without them, there's this sort of odd sort of compositional imbalance where you go, oh, it's cool there, but it's very empty there. Yeah. But like that logo in it, it looks official. It looks like, yeah, that's a real one, you know? <laughs> and um, so I would have liked all those ones to have been A3 with the, you know, the logo and all that sort of gear on. Yeah. Hmm. No, I agree. And I, um, I'm sure I would have said... Um, when we, we reviewed the posters at the time, that often that they do look they do look vacant across that top third because the banner, the phantom headline is just not there. That's right, yeah. And that that logo is so flipping big um, that yeah. it's, it's an intrinsic part of the composition. You know, it yeah, really yeah. looks cool. It's you know, it's the final. You've got to have that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, can we ask you some questions about gaslight? Yes. Um. I'm not sure you're what you're allowed to tell us or what you want to tell us, <laughs> but um, could you tell us about how you got involved with Gaslight? Uh, yep, like um, the this is the, the first Gaslight. I've actually written the second one, which I don't know if that's ever going to get published, but the first one was uh, Christopher Sequeira's idea, and I think he did seven instalments or whatever. And then I'm not exactly sure why he couldn't do the last ones, but he couldn't. And so Glenn just contacted me and said, "Help!" <laughs> and um, and he he did kind of want to 
to wind it up fairly rapidly. Hopefully, he said within two or three, I think they were nine page or eight page installments. Um, so within those parameters, it was kind of like, okay, you got to round it off so it makes sense and you got three installments to do it in. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so that was basically the brief. Um, and so I just did the best I could within those constraints. Um, and then Glenn asked for a second one, which Jason Paulos drew, and uh, that was called the, the Riddle of the Grey Malkin. And uh, I don't know if that's ever going to get published. That, that was a really good story too. Um, oh. But, uh, yeah, we'll just wait and see. I mean, like, there's, Jason Paulos is so fast as an artist. Yeah. And he produces so much. I reckon Glenn Ford could do nothing but publish Jason Paulos stories for a year. <laughs> it's just like oh, wow. a mountain of unpublished <laughs> stuff. So I don't know whether Gaslight, I don't even know if Gaslight's a goer or not, whether yeah. you know, it's got... I remember Jason sent me a photo or something, and you know those A3 folders? He had yeah. a stack of them like this, and he said that's all unpublished phantom yeah. stories that are all, that's all been scanned in, coloured, yeah. and, and it's just like, you know. Jason is so fast that uh, um, when I was writing this, the second Gaslight, he was drawing faster than I was writing. It was, it was, it was like, I'd, be, I'd send him like nine pages to draw, and I think, oh, that'll keep him busy for a couple of weeks. And then I'm sort of drawing the, writing the second episode, he's going, done. But what? I'm going, huh? So I've got to sort of like give him the first three pages of the next installment. I go, ah. <laughs> and, and I just have to tell him like, just slow down, just take a step off. Like, ah. But he couldn't do it. He's like, oh, no, I got to do something. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's a funny, he's he's a very talented guy, Jason. Like he, he he's a musician. Um, I heard he yeah. uh, also built his house and yep. um and, and and drawing and stuff like that. Um, yep. talking about Jason, another thing that that. I have found I've when I whenever I talk to uh, especially well any creators creators especially in Australia but also even overseas when they're dealing with Fru, yeah. they always somehow say oh yeah when I talk to Glenn Lumsden about this and that you seem to be like the dare I say it the glue of the company in a sense like there's all you seem to attract these phantom creators and they always bounce ideas off you or be a bit like a mentor to them. And is that by design or is that just, you're just a I'm, natural friendly guy? I, it's the first time hearing of it. So that's, I mean, that's <laughs> great. I, I, I bet I had no idea that that's uh, what was happening. Um, but uh, I, I guess what I, I know I've got years of experience. So obviously that's a plus. And um, I try to be uh, sort of reasonable and um, measured in my responses. So um, maybe that makes people feel that they can bounce any idea off me. I'm not going to go, that's stupid. Go, yeah, don't do that. Um, and I always try to give feedback, which is honest and authentic and nurturing and and useful. So, for instance, if some if, if you brought something to me that I, I, did, I thought was a bit of a weak story, I wouldn't say, this is rubbish, Duh, stop writing. I would go, okay, I think this is working. I think this bit doesn't quite work for me. And I think this is the reason why maybe, maybe it needs this. So you're actually, you're not making the person feel bad yep. or dumb or anything, and you're actually offering them a way to get better. And this is what I found with my art. I, in the in the um, early days of my art, when people criticised my art, it would just hurt me so much. And that was just my ego, you know, when in fact they were trying to tell me, Glenn, you're drawing all the heads too big. And if you just shrunk them on the photocopier by 10% and stuck them back on, your drawings would be three times better instantly. And it just took a while for me to appreciate that. It was like, they're helping me. They're giving me the roadmap to improve. And all I've got to do is shrink the heads 10%. It's, I've got to do hardly anything to make the drawing three times better. And once you 
approach criticism. I mean, it's got to be like positive criticism, not not you know, bagging abusive stuff. But once you approach people's comments and criticism in that way, you improve. It's actually it's it's the being your friend, and I like to have that attitude when people come to me with mm. stuff. Hearing yeah. you say that, I mean, it seems like a bit of a shame you spent so much time in a hot dog truck and uh, perhaps you should have been a teacher. I was but thinking I, exactly the same thing. <laughs> 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 I've always loved teaching as well. I, I Like when um, we had the doing the Phantom and we had this group, Barossa Studios, and there was me and about five other guys, um, I did enjoy the... The, the mentoring aspects because um, obviously they're coming to you. They don't have as much ex as experience as you do. And to be able to kind of – nothing makes you a better craftsperson yourself than having to teach someone because you really have to crystallise your thoughts and you've got to communicate well and you've got to do it in a positive way which inspires rather than puts people down. and yeah, if you can teach someone something, you usually really know that stuff yourself, you know, it, it, because it's reinforcing in you. Um, and sometimes I'll be, you know, I'll be in the process of mentoring someone and go, oh, you know, I didn't really realise that that's why I did that. <laughs> you know, it's just like now explaining it to you, so, well, that's why you, uh, uh. Yeah. so yeah. you're teaching yourself as well, really. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Amazing. It's, yeah, well, I've taught to, I can, you know, I can, think of several and they've all said that you know you've been you've been an immense help in in talking to and bouncing ideas off mentoring them and stuff like that so um uh yeah it's just i wanted to raise that because i i, I know there's creators out there that uh appreciate that work you've done with them well i'm stoked to hear that and it's an absolute pleasure to do that awesome now we probably should talk about the elephant, and that would have to be the grey elephant in the room when it comes to your covers. Um, yeah. Bring grey. it on. Bring it on. Grey. What's, can you tell us a little bit about your grey phantom? Yeah, well, when I was growing up and buying through comics, the phantom was always grey on the cover. And then somewhere like along the way, he became this bright vermilion <laughs> and and the people who were younger than me who had never grown up with the grey phantom, they're going, the phantom's this pinky purple. And, and you go, yeah, but he, but he used to be grey. No, 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 he's always, been, he's always been pinky purple. And then you go back to the really early phantoms where in the script, even though the comics were black and white, in the script it would say the grey ghost moves you know, like a grey this and this grey figure. And I saw it, it was a guy in a grey outfit. How can there be any confusion? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> now I know, the thing is, I'm not saying he can't be other colours. I'm not saying he can't be purple. But the purple people tend to go, he can't be grey. Uh, to me, that make, doesn't make sense. And, like, also, one of the great things about the Phantom I Love is that different countries have coloured him differently because they obviously just weren't told. <laughs> it was, And also, um, you know, people, the comic fans tend to think that um, all these decisions made in comics are made at a very high level of like, <laughs> we're going to have a meeting today and now we're going to discuss what colour, whereas in fact it's like, hey, we've got to colour this bloody comic which we've got to print today. What colour is he? I don't know. What colour paint have you got? I've got, I've got green. Okay, he's green. And then the next issue, it's like, we did him green last issue, but we don't have any green. Do you want to make him red? Okay, we're red. Make him red. <laughs> and that's what happens. And, and the fans can sometimes think that that is like, Oh, that's that's written in law. There was some big decision, you know, when in fact it was just a printer in Argentina just thought he looked good green. Meanwhile, a printer in France thought he looked good with red and blue pants. And I kind of like that because it's like there's a yeah. phantom, a different flavor phantom for you know everyone around the world. And um, it's purple here. Yeah, I know that's because it was the Billy Zane movie <laughs> phantom. So the thing is, I, I, I do the grey phantom for me because this is a vintage era phantom book, the giant size phantom. Yeah. Um, and then the more I did the grey, I just thought, bugger it. 
I like him grey. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've done the odd cover for the regular Phantom book. Yes. What I always try to do, though, is I always sample the, the, the grey from an actual old Fru comic, you know, with the eyedropper tool in Photoshop. Yep. So I, I just go through all the collection of Phantom covers, and I'll just go, yeah, that one, I drop it. That's the colour he's going to be in this cover, which always amuses me when people go, Phantom's not grey. And you go, well, he was in issue 46. Of, you know. <laughs> the funny thing is you look at all those through ones and it's like he's different shades of grey. Then it'll be like almost brown for one. Then it'll be grey again. Then it'll be kind of purpley grey. And then, and then somewhere in the late 80s, I think he was red for a, for a few issues or, or ready, ready brown. And then boom, bright, pinky, cerise, just mind-numbingly bad purple. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and he's kind of stayed there. It's like that's the color of the fan, but it's not the color he always was. Mm. And he's <laughs> instead of uh, jocks, he's wearing boy briefs. Yeah, yeah. The, I was about yeah. to ask, ask about the, the longer pants. Well, one thing I, I do love about the fan as well is that you know those old jungle gym movies where Johnny Weissmuller has his pants up around his nipples, like you know. <laughs> and the Phantom always seemed to have this, like his belt was almost like a corset. Which would start just <laughs> under his his, pe uh, his pecs, and it just gave him this appearance of wearing like hairy high pants kind of thing. And and I hate sluggos, so just having briefs to me kind of looks more modest and less kind of. You I reckon it doesn't uh, doesn't creep up his bum? Or as, oh, as you, what I really hate <laughs> is when they do the family's almost wearing a thong. You know, it's like this high cut thing. <laughs> and it's like ah! <laughs> no, just I like the the boxer shorts. Keeps you firm, keeps everything in place, allows you to get about the serious business of superheroing. <laughs> and um, you oh, know what? Man. This might be the first time on the podcast we've talked about the Phantoms undies. Yep. Well, you don't creep when you're fighting Outies. pirate. Yeah. Do you? It probably is. It's probably a podcast special in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the track. Um, I, always, I was honestly going to ask you, Glenn, about because um, your phantom is a is a thick set phantom. It's more of a a, a rock than a um, oh, you know, yeah, the, the live phantom. So you, you clearly like your your phantom with muscles. Yeah, but but I don't. And this is a mistake I made in the nineties. Well, not a mistake, but it was a choice which I wouldn't do now. Is having that overly ripply, you know, vein popping. Arnold Schwarzenegger build, whereas I just like the Phantom to be more like, like you see 50s movies with their, you know, the, the big strong actors. They're, they're big, but they're not like a swollen walnut, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Um, We've got the saying of, uh, yeah. what is it, a, a condom for the walnut? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. So I guess I'm aiming more for that 50s idea of what a – strong man would look like um and that with the hairy high pants and the boxer and the the, the brief the the shorts that's ticking all my boxes <laughs> so well, the good thing about that design is that uh guys is it means it it's 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 well it's more like us as well you know bigger and bulkier and <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got your beef on the outside too it is yeah <laughs> Uh, oh, classic. So, do you have any more uh, fandom stories? Uh, on yep. yep, yeah, I've got one which I hope to get in the next. Not the next giant size, as in the one I've just done the cover for, but the one after that. I'm doing a Phantom Ranger story with the Phantom. Nice. So that would be, I guess, technically set in the 1880s. Um, and yeah, the Phantoms obviously in the in the West. Um, and that's this time I'm doing that's a 13 pager because I figured that the last one, Death Dive, took me just so long. I just thought, okay, it's crazy to try to do another 28 pager. Now, I'm just realizing that 13 pages is too long for me as well. So <laughs> after this one, the next one's going to be six, seven pages. <laughs> because what ideally I would love to do one for each giant size, which means I've got three months. I should be able to do a seven pager in three months plus a color, you know. But I am so slow now. I, I'm basically doing a panel a day. So when I do a story and I count up all the panels, if it's 100 panels, 
doesn't matter how many pages it is. If it's 100 individual panels, that's going to take me 100 days. And you go, <laughs> ooh, that's... Ooh. So and then that's most of your three months. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's really deceptive. And that, also, what I found with this Phantom Ranger story, with the Phantom in it, um, because I worked on less pages, I didn't trim the story. So I actually just ended up doing, instead of doing four and five panel pages, I've got more eight and nine panel pages. <laughs> so I'm really doing the same amount of work. <laughs> You're probably not getting paid for the same either. You probably get paid less, eh? Because they pay you by yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So I'm, I'm getting paid well half because it's half the length, <laughs> yeah. um, which is all well and good. It's up to me because I get a free hand. Glenn just says, Dip, "Do whatever you want." Um, so I've got no one to blame but me. <laughs> <laughs> the next one, we're going to keep it simple, six or seven pages, and just try and keep it to six panels a page because that'd be that'd be forty two panels. 42 days. Mm. So, what's that? Two months. And don't forget, you said you wanted to uh, redo the covers as well. So, that's something else that you added. Yes. To your I reckon that would take me ages as well. I could, because I haven't picked up a brush for so long. I'm just going to have to mm. just get back into that. And then I could see myself spending a week or something um, doing each one. Because I wanted to be big. I, I like the idea of original art that if you hang it on your wall, it takes up a kind of impressive amount of size yeah, rather than a little statement pity. piece. Yeah, it's just go, whoa, whoa. And then you frame it, it gets even bigger. That's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, it's got to be big enough to hide the secret panel that is behind the piece. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, this has been a blast. Uh, guys, have you got any other questions? I think I'm just looking for the run sheet. I think oh, I. We'll be frozen solid. It's been yes. two hours. We <laughs> have to go out and revive it with it. <laughs> so, for those who are coming late, um, you've kicked your wife outside into the, cold, in, into the sub zero you... cold of Deloraine. It's probably like about one degree out there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can so you can spend two hours chatting with a bunch of uh, Phantom fans because priorities. What would the Phantom do? He would do that. <laughs> into the fog and the snow. <laughs> oh, um, guys, do you have any other questions? It's three oh, degrees. No, I, I don't, know. I don't have any other questions. What's well, that? It's three degrees. I just right? googled the weather. It's three degrees there. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> Except you're the one kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm nice and warm in my car, though. <laughs> so you would do what the Phantom would do. You're oh, saying, yeah, oh, darling, I will go out in the cold. Yeah, I know. Good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I've really enjoyed tonight. Um, just getting to know you, getting to um, getting to know you better, getting to uh, learning all the stories. Um, just you know, um, it's just it's, it's been a blast. Really, uh, really fun going through the the covers, the the Marvel stories, the the trading cards, and and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, on behalf of myself, I just really want to say thank you for um giving us your time tonight um and, I'll, and i'm sure uh free will be happy that you did your giant size cover before you talked to us as well so um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. um but yeah on behalf of myself uh, i'll let the guys say it as well but I, I appreciate your time tonight thank you very very much it's been an absolute joy and um enjoyed every second of it i'm really glad so i ended up relenting and going with the video thing rather than just having that black <laughs> screen with a voice coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, I'm still getting it, rid of Zoom though. I'm getting this Zoom is going off my heart. <laughs> second. Moment. Oh, that's good. Uh, guys, do you want to say anything before I sign out? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. And um, Glenn, one thing I was struck with through the conversation is how much, uh, whether you see it yourself or not, but I, you are a steward of the Phantom and who the fandom should be. And I really like having heard what you said about, um, you know, doing, doing what you wanted to do and, and needed to do for Marvel in the, in the day, but um, then being reflective of that and, um, and adaptive of that and, and, and the way that you really see, yeah, being a steward of who the fandom should be. Um, I, I, I love your approach and thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight and um, yeah looking forward to seeing more of your work my pleasure great talking to you
and you've spoken with such um, passion and, and, and enthusiasm for the character and, and all that you're doing. Like, yeah, I can't wait to, to see, well, to see the next giant size cover for starters and then and the rest of the, uh, and any future stories that hopefully they publish soon. Well, I'm really chopping at the bit to do. The one thing I find is my pace, because I'm so slow, I have all these stories I want to do and I keep on worrying I'm just going to run out of life. You <laughs> 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 might just have to get free uh, to do one bloody story. I was like, yeah, you know, might have to get Jason Paulus to uh, draw them for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have to run and, I wouldn't have a chance to write them. He'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. We had a blast uh, talking with Glenn, um, learning about him, learning about everything that he has done. Uh, like, uh, like Glenn said, if you are interested in putting your hand up for one of uh, for some commissions or original art and stuff like that, uh, please contact Glenn via his Facebook. We'll have that up on the screen if you are a YouTuber. Um, so, a thank you for Glenn. A thank you, Dan, <coughs> uh, Stephen, for uh, joining us on a school night. Um, so of course uh, you can find us on our website which is chroniclechamber.com our email address is chroniclechamber at gmail.com you can subscribe to us on iTunes Spotify all the various apps like Podbean Player FM uh, Castbox Listen Notes or Watch on YouTube now we are on uh, Twitter uh, Facebook and Instagram as well so if, if that is your poison uh, make sure you follow us on that um, so that's all from us today, uh, from myself, happy, fa happy phantomy and thank you for listening. Happy phantomy. Happy phantomy. Happy phantomy. Adios. Happy phantomy. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evil doers will believe that this Man cannot die. The Phantom, the ghost who walks. The Phantom, enemies beware. The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. He finds.